Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and perfectly magnify your holy name through Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Fellow Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this, we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, brothers and sisters, I know that you acted in ignorance 
as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. A reading from the first letter of John. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. 
No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is righteous with what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ, according to Luke. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do you doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed his hands and his feet. Yet for all their joy, they were still disbelieving and wondering. And he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I have spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that Repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Christ. see these resurrection appearances of Jesus in our gospel, and then 1 John says that when Jesus is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. But that begs a question, how do we see Jesus? Allow me to share a story. These last few years, I've been trying to get to know people in my neighborhood, my kids have been going to the same daycare just a few blocks from my house since they were infants. Last year, before Lewis started kindergarten, they were literally in the same classroom at school, which was just wonderful. Furthermore, my literal neighbor uh, had begun to work in that room, which meant we all saw Miss Maria very frequently. I was planning a big combined birthday party for the two of them, their birthdays are close to each other, and uh, inviting kids from preschool, other friends and family friends from church, kids in the neighborhood, etc. Miss Maria, some of her grandkids who lived with her, knew about the party and offered to make a cake for it. I can have issues with control, 
So part of me wanted to say, no, I'll just take care of it, it's okay. But that would be very awkward. And so I just said, of course, thank you so much. As the day drew near, I confirmed details with her and she said she'd drop the cake off the morning of the party. I, again, was kind and gracious, pretending to be nice, but secretly checking Target nearby <laughs> to make sure, when do they open? Can I go get a backup cake if this goes poorly? Well, the big day comes, and pretty early in the morning, I get a knock on the door, and Maria is there holding a cake literally this big. It has Paw Patrol figurines, that's the theme, and says, Happy Birthday, Lewis. I look behind her, and one of her grandkids is carrying another one, the same size, <laughs> that says, Happy Birthday, Bridget. Either of these would have been big enough for everyone at the party, and there are two. I was floored, I was stunned. At the party, people couldn't stop talking about how wonderful the cake was, how, you know, the flavor, the amount of it, it was incredible. Maria's daughter-in-law and, her, you know, her kids, again, who lived with her, were there, and the daughter-in-law kind of joyfully uh, informed me that Maria had stayed up essentially all night to make this cake for us. So here I was, uh, in my desire for control, worried about getting a backup cake from Target, uh, and landing in my lap was an overwhelming abundance from my neighbor. There's definitely a lesson here in never underestimating the cooking acumen and volume of an abuela in the neighborhood. So I learned something there, but it also served as an important reminder for me on how we see Jesus and God and the nature of hospitality. I've shared some before, I really love monasticism as a guide uh, to Christian living, so I have my pocket rule of Benedict here with me, in case anyone wants to talk about that. And one of the values of Benedictine monasticism, and Christianity in general, right, is hospitality. Chapter 53 says, all guests should be received as Christ. And I have long interpreted that along the lines of Matthew 25, when Jesus says that feeding the poor, caring for others, is like feeding him. Just as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you did it to me, he says. And that's great. I want to affirm that, of course. But you notice how that puts me or us in the comfortable position of giving something to someone else. Look how wonderful and Christ-like I am. I'm helping you. My sense is that many of us, perhaps especially mainline Christians, with great, again, Christ-like intentions, have been in that comfortable position of offering care or provision or help to those in need. And again, that is a very good thing. But this story with my neighbor Maria taught me something different. You see, Benedict's call to hospitality was not only about serving the poor and needy. It was also, perhaps even more so, about recognizing that Jesus might show up in the most unexpected way in order to bless me, in order to bless us. And can I see that? This helped me begin to learn the spiritual practice of receiving from others, of being the guest, not the host. In our gospel text, for instance, what brings the disciples back to relationship with the risen Jesus? It's not the proof of his resurrection when he shows them all of this. It's instead, it's when he asks them for something, some broiled fish. Some of you may know the poet uh, George Herbert. He's kind of a classic in Anglican Episcopal circles. And this idea of receiving is captured beautifully, very briefly, in a poem called Love. And it's the third one called Love. In this poem, the poet uh, describes having been invited to eat with Jesus. And he doesn't feel worthy to look at, much less eat, with God. 
Love, in the form of Jesus, says, well, I made your eyes. The poet replies, and here's the final stanza. Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame? My dear, the poet says, then I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. Perhaps you've felt that sense of unexpected, overwhelming blessing, which I felt from my neighbor, when Jesus showed up in her for me. If you haven't figured it out yet, God rarely meets our expectations in a simple or straightforward way. The disciples expected a triumphant king, especially after Palm Sunday, but then he was killed. And they were not expecting a resurrection on that Easter morning. Our gospel passage in Luke is set later on that day, perhaps during the evening meal. Maybe that's why they have fish available. The disciples all day have been hearing strange reports. Some of the women have seen angels, and the tomb apparently is empty. Some of the disciples have gone to verify this. What is happening? Mary Magdalene comes back telling them about the first powerful personal encounter with Jesus that she has had. And this earns her the title Apostle to the Apostles. Two more have, coming ba have come back sprinting from the town of Emmaus, describing another transformative encounter with the risen Jesus. And then boom, seemingly out of nowhere, Jesus is there with them. They're rightfully startled and terrified. Is this a ghost? Jesus assures them it is him. Touch and see, he says. They're still disbelieving and wondering until again shared food begins to reassure them. Perhaps assuming the familiar posture of a rabbi, he sits and begins to teach them just as he used to. Looking back from the vantage point of Easter to Good Friday and before, he begins to quote from the scriptures, perhaps chanting from the Psalms as, they've done, as they did, teaching and showing them that contrary to all their expectations, as Luke says, this was always God's plan. And something begins to click for those disciples. They encounter the risen Jesus who has passed through suffering and death and returned. This encounter completes the transformation that began when he called them years before. As again, 1 John says, when Jesus is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. Seeing, encountering the risen Jesus transforms us into his likeness. And while that verse can mean a mystical, beatific vision of the one God after death, it also means the humble and small work that we do in our everyday lives. If with the rule of Benedict we can begin to welcome all strangers as Christ, we too will be transformed. That may mean offering help to someone in need. It may mean putting ourselves in the uncomfortable place to receive from someone, as I did with my neighbor Maria. This week, our practice from the way of Jesus is go, and here is the card that I meant to grab beforehand that you should grab after the service. And part of what it talks about in that practice is that as Jesus went to the highways and byways, he sends us beyond our circles and comfort to witness to the love, justice, and truth of God with our lips and with our lives. We go to listen with humility 
and to join God in healing a hurting world. We go to become beloved community, a people reconciled in love with God and one another. So we go, listening and sharing. We go humbly offering what we have, and we go expecting to encounter the risen Christ. And so I ask one more time, how might, how might you, how might I, see the unexpected and risen Jesus coming to bless and transform us? Please join me in telling the story of our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten the Father, God from God, light from light, true God. God of resurrection, in this season of Easter, as we follow the way of Jesus, keep us courageous as we proceed. Proclaim your victory of love over death. God, in your wisdom. O God, in whose wisdom all things die, that they may be made new, we thank you for bringing us again and always out of death and darkness into the light of new life. May we see this beauty in all things. God, in your wisdom. We thank you for the work of the church in the world and our clergy, staff, and congregations. We pray for our friends in Bijonet, Haiti, and the parish of St. Andrews in Minneapolis. We pray that we may each be a light, a comfort, and a service to each other and to those of our communities and to the world. Guide our actions, God, and in your wisdom. We thank you, O God, for good government and for wisdom and leaders. Give our leaders and each of us the courage, insight, and strength to act in the best of interest of all members of the human family of our fellow creatures and of the earth, our home. Help us and our leaders to address our disagreements with truthfulness, open, openness, 
of heart and kindness of speech and action. Quicken our courage, God, and in your wisdom. For this beautiful planet, diverse in its creatures and cultures, we thank you, O God. We pray that nations work together with open hearts and minds to bring justice and peace to our suffering world. We pray especially for all of those who live in the midst of war in the Holy Land, in Ukraine, Sudan, and beyond. May the goodness that you have planted in each of us rise up out of darkness, pain, and destruction to help make our pr prayer a reality. In your wisdom, we thank you, O oh God, that we call Minnesota, Minneapolis, and our neighborhoods home, and for all the blessings that accompany our belonging, inspire all of our leaders, and help us all to do good in the world and to each other. Give us gratitude, humility, and strength, God, and in your wisdom, we praise and thank you, O oh God, that though our difficulties, pain, loss, and suffering, you carry us, comfort us, and bring us through into a new and better place. Comfort and heal all who are ill, in trouble, in pain, or in any kind of sorrow. And may we be instruments of your solace. We pray for the healing we all need. We pray especially for Alice, Andy, Dennis, Bishop Michael Curry, Bob, Bob and Tony, Chris and Jerry, Christy, Cynthia, Diana, Emily, Eric, Gladys, Hugh, Jazz, Jamie, Sherry, Joanne and Jim, Joe, Kathy, Larry, Lori, Linda, Lois, Paul, Pauline, Penny, Roger, Tracy and Kathy, Val and Will, and, and those we name now. God, in your wisdom, hear our prayer. We give thanks, O oh God, for good medical practice and for the ministry of hospice. We pray for those in hospice, for their caregivers, that they, their suffering and fear may be assuaged, and that they may see the light in the darkness for Susan Wiesner and those we name now. God, in your wisdom, we give thanks for the lives of our beloved departed, and we pray that what little they may still need to be granted for those we name now. God, in your wisdom. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you.
All things come from you, O God. And God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. Glory to you forever and ever. At your command, all things came to be the vast expanse of interstellar space galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. By your will, they were created and after me. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Have mercy, Lord. For we are sinners in your sight. Again and again you called us to return. Through prophets and sages you revealed your righteous law, and in the fullness of time you sent your only Son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. By Christ's blood we are reconciled. By Christ's wounds we are healed. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. So, Almighty God, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit, now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate Christ's death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our holy and righteous forebears, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen the Lord, be known to us in the of prayer. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit your church gives honor from generation to generation. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. 
Karen, Michelle, Lee, and Candy, I send you out bearing these holy gifts to Barb, Shar, and Bobby, that they may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We who are ready for one body, because we all share the one bread and the one cup. Let us pray. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of our Savior Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace, and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Savior. My friends, just a few quick announcements, and then I think I have some helpers who are going to help me with the final blessing, so be seated for just a second. Um, <clears throat> if you're new visiting with us this morning, we're so glad you're here. We hope you join us for coffee hour right through this door as soon as the service is over. And then at 11.30, I believe we'll be back in this space for the forum, and this is a great day. If you haven't gotten to know our interim director of music, David Austin Somore, today's a great day to come to the forum because he's gonna be the one uh, speaking to us. Do you wanna, t do you have a one-liner? No, it's gonna be amazing, be here, 11.30. A few more things to draw your attention to. Uh, today, we're sharing the elder profile of Lenisa Liana. I don't think Lenisa's here today, but you can find it. It's a pink sheet out there where the um, ushers gave you your bulletin. Elder profiles are just one of the ways that we work to create community and relationship here at Grace. So I hope you'll read it and then get to meet her. There is a springtime tea coming up on May 18. Um, you can see information about that in your bulletin. This is a fundraiser for our congregation. And no one has told me that any particular fancy hats are required. <laughs> but I might wear one. And so could you. On Wednesday evenings in May, uh, we'll be gathering for dinner again. The Intrepid Parish Life team is going to be organizing dinners from some really yummy local restaurants. And after dinner, kids and adventurous adults are going to be preparing for our Pentecost worship service. And we will have a program about depolarizing and nonviolence. If you are looking at the upcoming elections and wondering how a person of faith or good conscience can walk the way of Jesus in the midst of this incredibly polarized culture, this series is for you. We'll be drawing on some of the tools of an organization you might have heard of called Braver Angels. There will be information in your email inbox about this in just a few days. We will share more information coming soon. If you'd like to help with those dinners, you're going to be making the magic happen, y'all. That's where community happens is around the table. So we're looking for volunteers to help with that, and there's a sign-up sheet in the commons on the bulletin board. I also want to tell you, uh, last week some folks made an announcement about a movie called God and Country that speaks to this very issue. In fact, one particular dynamic of it is around the issue of Christian nationalism. We have to walk a really particular road here, friends, which is the road of being able to be clear that any ideology that takes Christianity and uses it to elevate one group of people or one country is counter to all of Orthodox Christianity. And we have to be able to walk the road of being able to be in relationship with people with whom we differ politically and theologically. So if you're interested in seeing that movie, it's gonna speak very directly to the issue of white Christian nationalism. Karen Murdoch and Peter Otterson, would you raise your hands? They're both in the choir. If you have questions about the movie, go see them. And as you're watching, be thinking to yourself, how do I stay in relationship with people with whom I differ so much? I think it's time for the blessing, and I need some helpers. I need some helpers. If you're a kid and you're going to be my helper with the blessing, can some, can some of you come on the side? And some here, yeah. Oh, Isaac, you know what? Can I pick you up? Would you let me pick you up? No, okay. Will you come stand next to Lewin? That's okay. It's good to have boundaries. This is perfect. You guys go over here. Can everybody say it's good to have boundaries? Okay. 
Okay, friends, we're going to do a blessing. Please stand. It has four parts. After each part, we say amen, and each time the amen gets a little bit louder, and these children know how to do it, and I hope that you will learn from them. Are you ready? I'm not. Hang on. Okay, I'm ready now. May Almighty God, who has redeemed us and made us his children through the resurrection of his Son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of Amen. And it get louder each time, right? May God, who through the water of baptism raised us from sin into newness of life, make you holy and worthy to be united with Christ. Amen. May God, who has brought us out of bondage to sin into true and lasting freedom in the Redeemer, bring you to your eternal inheritance. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the most holy, glorious, and undivided Trinity, be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen.